Thank you for tuning into the Rowdy Cards podcast on RowdyCards.com. I have with me Ryan Daly joining us again today, talking about all kinds of interesting things. We're going to be discussing the uh, World Series results, Willie McCovey, Dave Parker, uh, some interesting eBay auctions, and we're going to share some input on some stuff we've purchased recently. So, Ryan, why don't you introduce us with the Red Sox winning the World Series this year in 2018? Yeah, it was a pretty eventful World Series. Uh, I, for one, was hoping for a Game 7, um, and we only got to Game 5. The Red Sox basically plowed over the Dodgers. Um, but it was pretty epic just because these two like sports behemoths, two big market teams kind of going at it. Um, and I was very thankful that we at least got the Game 3, which went to 18 innings which um, I don't think it's the longest World Series game by innings, but it was definitely the longest by time. It was like a seven-hour game, 18 innings. That's basically two games in one. Um, so that was high drama watching here on the West Coast until I think just past midnight when the Dodgers finally won. That was I think it was the only game they won. <laughs> but uh, so they when the Dodgers finally won, uh, it was just past midnight on the West Coast, so all those poor Red Sox fans, um, you know, they're up till 3 o'clock in the morning, which I'm sure a lot of them were because we know how Red Sox fans are. Um, so congrats to the Red Sox. They've had a lot of success, obviously, um, in the early part of this um, century. And if they can keep that team sort of more or less the way it is with Chris Sale and J.D. Martinez, Smokey Betts. I mean, they have some monsters on that team. Yeah, they got and David Price and Rick Porcello. And David Craig, Price and was, Craig Kimbrell. Craig Kimbrell. David Price was. Uh, he's sort of known for being a bit of a shaky postseason performer, but he was absolutely dominant. And I, I think um, Steve Pierce ended up winning the MVP of the World Series, which he deserved. But you could make a case for David Price as well if you consider what he did in a couple of games there. Um, so a lot of guys stepped up for the Red Sox. Um, Dodgers bats were just super cold. All those big bats, Justin Turner, Cody Ballinger, Jock Peterson, uh, Yasiel Puig, you know, it was, it was not a good showing from them. And losing the World Series back-to-back -back has got to be a big blow to morale in that clubhouse. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're still a very talented team, so um, they'll be back at it next year looking to be competitive yeah the red sox's pitching roster is like severe i mean it's lethal and so you've got like these just incredibly talented pitchers i mean that's just their pitching staff too and mm -hmm. they've got they've got a, a pretty severe offense as well and so you've got i think they were just more talented honestly at the end of the day just get like not just a little bit more talented though like they're they're quite a bit more talented than the dodgers and so i i you know, living in LA, I have to, you know, be like excited to see the Dodgers go to the postseason two years in a row. I'd like to see them get a World Series again, like a win a championship again. But um, got a hand at the Red Sox. They've really, they've come a long way. I mean, they really have. And uh, since the uh, the end of the Curse of the Bambino in the 2000s with uh, David Ortiz, um, really helped kind of, you know, boost things with them. And also they picked up that analytics sort of mindset. Um, and mm -hmm. they've, they've been able to kind of parlay that into success and results. And so it's, it's, it's awesome to see that really, really awesome to see that. And so I'm really happy for them. I think that they did a fantastic job and I'm, I'm excited to see, um, some chatter around David Price again. It's been a while. I know that he's kind of had a, a tough time. Um, I've been wanting a David Price card for a while and I actually picked one up just yesterday uh, but I think that the end price was a bit high because of the, his World Series results. I think that it was listed right at the right time. And oh, so yeah. <laughs> I, I certainly think that the, the gentleman who listed was smart about that. Uh, but it was a card that I I was like, this is going to be the one. I'm going to have to get this card because um, I've been after a David Price card for you know, a number of years. And, and I wanted to get something high end that's kind of fits my collection. And so this particular one was... Uh, is a solid piece. Uh, for those of you listening or wondering, it's 2007 Bowman Chrome Orange Refractor, non-autographed, PSA yeah. 9, I think. And so 
uh, that, that's incoming. That's in transit. I'm excited to get that into the archive. That'll be a nice addition. But yeah, David Price is good to see he's dominant now. Um, he's been playing now for you know a while, um, and so it's good to see there's still some chatter around his successes. So good for him. Yeah, if there was a time to move David Price, it was post World Series. So um, I, I have one David Price that I was I've been trying to move. I tried several times a couple years ago and tried again. <laughs> it was just, yeah, uh, maybe we'll see. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the market is for him. It was just really cold and it's not a rookie card. Uh, it is kind of a rare piece, but sure. yeah, maybe we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Moving on. Um, sadly the giants have lost one of their legends. Willie McCovey passed away at 80 years old. Uh, he actually had an incredible career play for 22 years. Um, and, uh, you know, he actually has career number of home runs, 521. He, he he is tied with Ted Williams and my favorite, Frank Thomas. So that was, it's really cool to see that. I actually um, uh, was reading up on some of his background uh, a little bit just today. And it turns out that he and Duke Snyder uh, were in trouble because of tax fraud for failing to report income tax for autograph signings and memorabilia shows. Now, oh. I, I don't know, and that was back in 95, I don't know if that was intentional because, you know, knowing that you're supposed to file taxes for those kinds of things might not be intuitive. Um, right. I don't, I don't really know that it, the, the, the details on that particular thing, but he was fined and sentenced to two years probation. Um, he was pardoned in January 17 by Barack Obama. He actually, in, in 2000... Uh, the Giants moved to a new ballpark in the China Basin area. Uh, and the body of water beyond the right field wall was renamed McCovey Cove in his honor. So it's kind of a cool little fact for you. Yeah, uh, McCovey Cove made famous by Barry Bonds, who hit thousands of home runs. <laughs> thousands. <laughs> thousands of them. <laughs> um, and Barry Bonds, uh, if, if you guys are curious, go on twitter and look up barry bond's account he had a really touching kind of multi-part post about willie mccovey because i think they were along with willie mays um barry bonds and his dad were was all they were also close with willie mccovey and mm -hmm. um so yeah sad news uh but he, he lived a long life obviously yeah. an amazing career Truly. 521 is a huge number for home runs yes um especially playing in the, in the ballpark he played in so yeah, you know that the Giants, the team created an award as honor called the uh, Willie Mack Award. It's given annually to the Giants' most inspirational player, uh, which McCovey presented every year at the beginning of the team's final home stand of the season. And I'm sort of reading this article here right at you. Um, I'll credit it in the uh, the blog post. So you can go back there and, and reference it if you'd like to read a little bit more about him. Uh, really, you know, he's great. He's super tall. Like I was like six four, a beast. Mm -hmm. He's a, just a big dude, uh, but he played 19 of his 22 major league seasons with San Francisco Giants, and uh, he was a he was a fan favorite. So I remember learning about his rookie card, 1960 tops, that sideways card. Uh, it's a very just a key card to have if you collect rookie cards. It's one to get if you like the like vertical classic design. The 61 is a nice option as well. 61 tops uh, for those of you collectors out there. Um, so it's, you just wanted to like mention that cause he's, you know, he was a, he's a legend. So there you have it, William McCovey. Uh, we've lost the Giants legend at, at age 80, but we enjoyed him for many years and we're sad to see him go, but well, he'll be remembered for forever. Yes, absolutely. 1960 is a super cool card to have. Yeah. Um, I don't personally have it, but after the news today, it was kind of reminded me that I should hop on that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a, just a card to get. Like, it's one of the key rookies from the 60 tops. You know, really, the whole 60s block, um, that's one to get. Uh, I always filed his cards. I still do when I get, like, vintage or whatever, and I see a McCovey. He goes into the, uh, the vintage box. I always liked his stuff. So, in, in less, less somber news, if you will, uh, let's talk about Dave Parker. You guys might remember him. When the, he played with the Pirates in the, the 70s. And uh, moved over to like the Brewers later in his career. He played with the Reds for a while. Um, 
It's a very dominant player, in my opinion. And, you know, let's let's talk about it. He's not in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. But this is a this is an interesting conversation because his numbers are, you know, compar- comparable, if not better, than those of Tony Perez, who is in the Hall of Fame. Okay, let's talk about this for a minute. Tony Perez, two-time World Series, same with Dave Parker, two-time World Series. Seven-time All-Star. Dave Parker is a seven-time All-Star. Uh, Tony Perez, All-Star MVP. Dave Parker also was an All-Star MVP. But that ends it for Tony Perez's accolades. But let's keep it going with David Parker. Dave Parker, three-time Gold Glove, two-time batting title, three-time Silver Slugger, and he was a general MVP. Okay? He played for 19 years. All right? Tony Perez played, obviously, a lot longer, 23 years. That's a crazy career. You don't see those in the 20s anymore. That's very rare. Uh, but batting average for Dave Parker, ready for this? Career, 290. All right, home runs, 339. Hits, 27-12. Tony Perez, batting average, career, 279. Home runs, 379. Hits, 27-32. Very, very close. Very mm-hmm. close. Mm-hmm. So I think that... You know, I look at this and I'm thinking, like, why isn't Dave Parker in the Hall of Fame? He has all the, the like, he has all the, the key attributes to put him in. Like, why why didn't he make it? You know, you've got uh, on-base percentage, 339 for Dave Parker. Tony Perez, on-base percentage, 341. It's very close. Slugging percentage, Dave Parker, uh, 471. Tony Perez, 463. So you've got these, like, um, these these numbers are so closely related. And arguably, Dave Parker's numbers are better in some ways, in a lot of ways. And so, you kind of have to think, like, why didn't he make it in the Hall of Fame? Why hasn't he made it in the Hall of Fame yet? You know? Um, that's the positive, is the stats, right? But yeah, people go into the Hall of Fame not just because they're great on the field, because they're great people. They look at both of those things. They look at quality on and off the field as well. Let's talk for a minute about the Pittsburgh drug trials. I read about this today because you had mentioned it in notes. Um, now, this is my understanding. You know, Ryan, you want to just introduce us with this? Yeah, Pittsburgh drug trials are interesting little piece of baseball history. Um, I know that the most famous like drug era in baseball is you know, like the Mitchell Report, the steroids, um, which happens. 90s sort of bleeding into the early 2000s um but there were the pittsburgh drug trials where several players in the 80s were ordered to um testify in front of a grand jury and uh it was about illicit drug use in the clubhouse um during games um you know after games before games um and Dave Parker was one of those guys that was forced to testify. And just being forced to testify is sort of muddies your name right there. Um, even if you're not technically convicted of every any, anything. Right. Because we've seen that also. Yeah. Yeah. Steroids is the same thing. It's like if, if you're even rumored to be associated with it, a lot of people just kind of assume that you are. Just classic guilty by association thing. Yeah. Uh, so there's, you know, Lonnie Smith was one of those guys that was uh, associated with this as well. Uh, you know, Daryl Strawberry. There, there's some big names from the 80s that um, were known to be um, using drugs in the clubhouse during games. Tim um, Raines is a, an avid Tim Raines, admitter. Yeah. But also Keith Hernandez had made it clear that he was you know taking coke during the games. Yep. Uh, Dwight Gooden. Um yeah, so there's a lot of names, and I, I got to imagine that given Dave Parker's numbers, the one of the number one reasons he's not in the Hall of Fame is because of this this era. Um, so check out that the Pittsburgh drug trials. Um, a lot of players sort of went down with that, for better or for worse. Um, but, you know, MLB had to do something about it. It was not something you want your players to be doing. Right. So, okay. So it, it, as it were, the, the Pittsburgh drug trials put people on, um, they had consequences for certain groups of people. And, uh, the verdict was there was a, there was a block of guys that got, you know, time in prison because they were distributors of cocaine. 
And then there was a block of guys that got suspensions, and this is the block that in which uh, Dave Parker uh, is listed. These guys ended up giving they were they, they were um, allowed to continue playing under the condition that they donated ten percent of their base salaries to drug abuse programs, and mm. that they had uh, submitted to drug tests and contributed a hundred hours of drug related community service efforts. Hmm. Um, so he was in that block and then there was another block below that. It gets like, you know, it becomes less and less severe as we go down. There's another block of guys that were uh, suspended for 60 days. Um, and they were required to donate 5% of their base salaries. And then there was another guy's b- block beyond that, that were named, but not suspended or otherwise punished. And that's where like Tim Raines is and Rod Scurry and some of these other guys, Vita Blue, Dusty Baker, Gary Matthews. Manny Sarmiento, I didn't know he was part of that. That's interesting. Yeah, so I'll, this is linked in the blog post if you want to like link back and read more about this particular uh, uh, block of American history, sort of black history of the uh, baseball league. I say not 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 ethnicity wise, but like um like black socks, like that kind of like undertone that it's been disgraced in some way. Yeah, and it's it's sort of forgotten in a way. And yeah, because of the steroid era, and. It's, I don't know what's what's worse, you know, <laughs> doing coke or doing steroids. Um, oh, that's like, dude, it's six and one, half dozen the other. Like, it's the yeah, same it's, same difference. Out, you know, it, these are and, all these are some are like uppers and some are downers. And so, like, depending on what you're taking, I'm not saying a steroid or cocaine is, is, is one or the other. I'm just saying that, like, drugs in general do something to your body. And so if you're taking them for some kind of enhancement, whether I mean like to relax as an enhancer or to be stimulated as an enhancer, what you're doing is you're changing your natural course of uh, like chemicals balance in your body in some way, some form. And so all this stuff is is very um, detrimental to both your reputation, your performance, um, and I guess in this case, your chances of getting the Hall of Fame. So this to me would be my understanding why Dave Parker has not made it into the Hall of Fame because of his association with Pittsburgh drug trials. Mm-hmm. That would be my understanding. That's got to be it because he had great numbers. Great numbers. And He's a fantastic played for player. Some great teams. He played for the the Pirates in the 70s. I mean, that's that's pretty epic. So Yeah. Yeah. He spent a good chunk of time with Cincinnati and then he was with Oakland for a bit. Milwaukee and he, 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 in 91, he was with, I didn't know this, the California angels. Have you seen this? I didn't know he mm-hmm. was with the angels in 91 In yeah, 91. I, I always remember him with Milwaukee brewers, but you know, that's, it's hard to keep up with the Dave Parker news. Is he, he's not still on the ballot. Is he? I don't think he, I mean, he's, he's been retired for a while. So I, I can't imagine he's being considered anymore. I mean, yeah, he, 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 he hung it up in 91 you know. So it's like 91, 96, he was probably eligible. And, and then, then he only gets so many years, right? Now, I yeah, will say this, get... though. They let they let Ron Santo in like decades and decades and decades later. Yes, so... there's there's all these like weird caveats to the Hall of Fame. There's the, uh, the Hall of Fame Veterans Committee or Legends yeah. Committee where, you, yeah, you can make these exceptions um, after the fact. Um so maybe there's a chance for him, but I think if you get like a certain percentage of the vote, if you get like 25% of the vote, your name at least stays on for next year, even if you don't get in that year. Is it, uh, is it, I mean, is that, is that the threshold or is there, are there times when you can go below that? I, I don't know. I don't, I'd have to have to research it. I was just curious if you know offhand. Yeah, there is a threshold that, that at least keeps your name on the ballot. Yeah. Um, but if you go a year and you don't hit that threshold, then you're off and you're done. So yeah. um, huh. he probably floundered around that threshold for a couple of years just because his numbers were so incredible. Um, but I'd be surprised if he was still on. So if let me ask you this. If you're in the Veterans Committee, like admissions council, mm-hmm. which I you, am, would you, by the way, <laughs> of course, <laughs> uh, would you consider Dave Parker? Would you give him like a pass? Mm. knowing his history, knowing his surroundings and like the whole Pittsburgh drug trials thing. I mean, would you give I would him a say pass? as a hypothetical member of the Hall of Fame Veterans Committee or whatever we're going to call it, yeah. <laughs> we, we would need to decide also about the steroid players. 
because if you're going to start to touch upon these guys that had their name dirtied by the Coke scandals in the 80s, then what are we going to do about all these amazing players that have associations with steroids? Well, let's not forget that Tim Raines made the Hall of Fame. Okay. There you go. He 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 he's uh he's in and he, the, that he, was he recent, got it right? in 2017. Yeah, yeah. So if he can get in, you know, and and his numbers are like they're good. They're not Dave Parker numbers, but they're pretty good, you know. And I would say if you're gonna let Tim Raines in, and you're gonna let Tony Perez in, you darn well better let Dave Parker in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's me talking to admissions committee council member right now, All right? <laughs> so I just think that like, if, I guess where does the you know where does the where's the line? That's the, always the question. Like where do you stop? Like okay, Tim Raines gets in. You know, who spent like something like 40 grand on cocaine a year for a number of years in his early career. Um, You know, who else are you going to let into that list? Yeah, it's I mean, uh, I've always seen the Hall of Fame voting decision making process is a little arbitrary. And I try not to be too offended by it. If there's a player I was really pulling for to get in who doesn't get in. Yeah. Um, and I think most of the time they get it right. Um, there are obvious choices that need to go in first ballot hall of famer type guys. Yeah, of course. And then, but there's a bunch of guys kind of in the middle that are like right around the cream of the crop. Um, so uh, yeah, Tim Raines is, is a great example. If you just pull up his numbers, um, without sort of considering his, uh, significance in, in baseball. It, they're not, I mean, they're, they're really great numbers. He had a fantastic career, but, um, you know, he hasn't had 3000 hits. He doesn't have 500 home runs. Um, he hit for average though. So like he wasn't, you know, he's, he wasn't, he wasn't kicking him over the, 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 the fence all the time. What I'm saying is that like stats were really great. They weren't hall of fame. You know, like mm-hmm. to me, like I look at Tim Ranz, like he was really good. But he wasn't Ricky Henderson, okay? Yeah, right. sure, he could steal bases, but, you know, you, you've got guys. I just, I don't know, like, there's always an argument. Like, if you're going to let him in, who else are you going to let in? If, and then, like, if you're going to let that guy in, you're going to let this guy in. And eventually you're going to, like, muddy out and fluff up the Hall of Fame with just these, like, kind of okay, pretty good guys, not these Hall of Fame guys. I mean, where, where's the bar? I see Tim Raines as like a really good player, but not a Hall of Fame player. That's just based on his statistics. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you can, I think you it's the, make that argument with like one guy every couple of years. You can like say, like, oh, I do I see Jack Morris as a Hall of Famer? You know, like I, I don't. I I just kind of think like I never filed Jack Morris because he was never listed in the price guides. He was never listed in the price because he wasn't good enough. People weren't collecting him. There's a reason for that. He wasn't mm-hmm. performing. I mean, yeah, he had some like peak times and moments in his career, but do those peak times and moments necessitate a Hall of Fame induction? That's what I that's what I think about is like the whole totality of it, not just one or two spikes of like, oh, that was awesome. Um, so, yeah, well, like Bill Bill Mazeroski, I know is one guy that people always point to is sort of a question mark in the Hall of Fame. Oh yeah, and he was a Veterans Committee player that got in that route. Yeah. Um, but he he's most famous for hitting a walk off game seven World Series home run, uh, winning it for the Pirates. I want to say in like 1960. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like you said, there's there's obviously a few amazing moments throughout a, a player's career, but you got to kind of take it in totality. And if you look at Mazeroski's numbers, they are not that impressive. very borderline. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to Mr. Mazeroski if you're listening. But uh, well, he's got. I mean, he's ten time All Star. Yeah, I know, so, he's but but it's all player. But but if you're gonna put him in, you better darn well put yeah. in Andrew Jones because Andrew Jones' numbers yes. are incredible. Yes, you know. That, so that's been. I mean, there, there are arguments all over the board with this kind of thing. You can talk until you're blue in the face about who should be and who shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, at the end of the day, baseball is very difficult to play with any degree of success. Uh, with Mazeroski, I'm looking at his numbers and. Yeah, 260 career batting average, 138 home runs, just over 2,000 hits. And you start to think, like, what? what's the big deal here? 
Why are they mm-hmm. giving this guy All Star? I, I I just like you know you start to think about like what what brings All Star attraction. Like if I were on the All Star development committee, who would I pick and why? We start to think about the requirements for this. You know, getting into Harvard, it's like okay, eight hundred on the GMAT. Of course, it's very rare. It's like seven fifty or above on the GMAT. You know, three point eight five or above, or three point nine as an undergrad cumulative GPA. Uh, you might have you know, extracurricular activities thrown in there. What kind of leadership roles did he have? What kind of you know volunteering did he do? That kind of thing. And so, with baseball, I look at okay, well, how did he perform? You know, what is his batting average? Which is slugging percentage? Which is, you know hits and you know home runs and you know, how many bases did he steal? How many times did he get out? These kinds of things. I don't know what the curriculum looks like for, like, all-star game player induction. And so I'm thinking, looking at Bill Mazeroski's stats, I'm thinking to myself, gosh, who was it that was picking this guy up every year for 10, 10 years? You know? I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to think Yeah, about. he's he's a question mark for sure. <laughs> um, but there's, and there's, I mean, we, we just talked about, several different examples of guys that are in the hall of fame and guys that are not in the hall of fame. They're right. all kind of question marks. So, yeah. Anyway, just want to touch on that. I think it's interesting to think about like Dave Parker gets very little hobby interest. And I've always known that like even his rookie cards and nine sell for like a hundred bucks. I mean, it's just, just one of those things that like, you know, it might not be a bad idea to pick up a Dave Parker or file a Dave Parker <laughs> cards into your collection because he's, he was great. He was a great player. Moving on. Uh, speaking of stuff that's that's you know interesting on eBay, notable eBay sightings. I got two two items here. Uh, first being a 1974 Topps Ken Griffey rookie card in PSA 10 that's recently sold. It's already at uh, 600 bucks now. I noticed this auction I think yesterday, and and a 10 in this card at 600 is is already 10 times more than a nine. Nine sell for about 60 bucks. So uh, it's got quite a few days left as we speak. Uh, it's gonna be interesting to see kind of where this ends up, but gosh, what a great card! I remember when I was younger, um, collecting King Griffey Jr. and then learning about his father very shortly thereafter, and wanted to get some, you know, stuff as dad. So I'd file his dad's cards in with Griffey Jr. like just kind of going together in the pages, mm-hmm. and um, I remember picking up like a seventy-five or one of the seventies cards and being like, Oh my gosh, you got a really early Ken Griffey card and being kind of bummed out that his stuff wasn't more desirable, more collectible, uh, when I was younger, but it wasn't until later that I got a Griffey senior rookie card and I've since acquired several more copies, but it's one of my favorites from the 74 top set. And as you know, Ryan, the 74 top set, um, well, it's significant for a couple of different reasons. One being it finishes off what people consider the, vintage years people often stop at 74 to me like i kind of take that up into like 1980 you know mm-hmm. i like i just kind of extend that myself but i've noticed that vintage people people collect vintage they they say anything up to 74 and we don't we don't buy anything beyond 1974 so 74 is significant in that way but also quality control hadn't kicked into any significant degree compared to what it is now then so you've got a lot of off-centered stuff that took place you know that that were printed back then edging issues and this kind of thing so seeing a 10 uh from 74 is is significant ryan do you have a copy of this card i don't um i don't think i have any ken griffey trying to think here uh, the card that you were talking about is also kind of cool because it's from the Dimitri, Dimitri Young collection, which oh, those yeah. who don't know is That's right incredible PSA registered set that used to belong to former player Dimitri Young. Yeah, he's a huge collector. He had like PSA 10 rookies through the nose, um, vintage, just crazy examples of huge cards. Mm. I mean, the, the, the PSA slip is like custom for Dimitri Young. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's how big the collection was. Like that's how significant, significant it was. Yeah. That's you know keeping that flip there as it is is very like I think significant part of history to just I've met I've known some guys who buy these and they get the flip swapped out because they don't like the pedigrees and I'm like that's I understand that I can respect that cool uh, but it's just one of those things that like once it's gone you, I guess you can go back and say hey can you put this back in but mm-hmm. it's just a lot of work and I, it's nice to see Dimitri Young collection listed on the flip itself. He, Do you think it adds anything to the price for any Dimitri Young card? 
for Dimitri Young's cards? I mean, yeah, for his <laughs> his cards, not like, for like cards the ones he used on to it. own or the cards depicting Dimitri Young. Uh, the cards he used to own. Yes, I think that this adds a degree of collectability to the cards because knowing that they were owned by Dimitri Young and how significant his collection was um, speaks of its collectability. And I think that if we compare this listing to a generic PSA 10 of this card without the, 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 the Dimitri Young pedigree on it, um, I think we're going to find a price difference that might be considered significant by some. Don't quote me on that because this auction hasn't ended, obviously, but um, when it does, you might go back and compare how this one performed over a PSA 10 without the Dimitri Young line item on it, on the flip. Mm -hmm. um, I'm watching it just because I'm curious to see where it goes. Obviously, I have no intention of buying. I'd be happy with a 9, calling it a day. Mm -hmm. um, but this is comes from the same set that Dave Parker's rookie card is, is, is in, and also the Dave Winfield is also in this set as well. Bucky Dent has a rookie too. There's, I mean, 74 Tops has got... You know, a block of pretty important rookie cards, and um, the uh, the Ken Griffey Senior rookie card is one of those cards I really appreciate. So one of my favorite cards from the seventies. So you have it. Um, next one on the list here is nineteen ninety nine Metal Universe Gem Master, mm -hmm. um, Darren Erstad. So this is an interesting piece because. Um, for those of you that collected 99 metal universe, you probably wish to pull a precious metal gems parallel. And for those of you that did probably wish you'd pull the gem masters parallel gem masters are the, um, one of one parallels and they have a different pattern on the front. Very interesting stuff. I've never seen one in person, but I've seen a couple online. This gentleman wants $2,000 OBO for the Darren Erstad. He won't get that. Mm -hmm. Um, but a gentleman, a buddy of mine, got the Fred McGriff Gym Masters, uh, and he paid, I think, like four fifty for it auction style. And so, you know, Fred McGriff is close to Hall of Fame talent, um, and and Darren Erstad probably not so much. So you'd think like, what's realistic for the Darren Erstad? I think like two hundred, two fifty, right in there is probably fair for this card. Yeah, um, I would be one of those buyers that would consider it at that price. So would I. I'm an Erstad fan, and it's such a cool card. It is. Um, I love how it, on the back they they spell out the only one of one yeah. gem masters. Yeah, totally. It's just like so definitive instead of just having the numbers there. Um, yeah. Super cool card, and then just the the parallel print on the front. The base card I think is really awesome. I love the Caught in the Fly series. That's um, right. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I had a bad habit of like opening a pack and fanning out the cards to see if there was a hit and just going straight to that card. And I'm, I remember opening up a lot of Fleer metal and fanning them out and seeing the straight silver background of cotton, the fly. Yeah. And I, th they weren't necessarily rare. I think they were like one in six packs or one in 10, something like that. So if you bought a box, you'd get a couple of them. So those are uh, that, that subset in the set is they're short printed. You think? Uh, I think so. I like the Cotton design, fly. too, with the little, like, yeah, yeah. bee on there with the hat. It's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very 90s. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of that. I mean, I just like this. I just I like this set a lot just by design. But when mm -hmm. you had, like, a hollow foil print background for the PMGs and this, like, sparkle hollow foil thing with the Gem Masters parallels, it just mm -hmm. really makes a card pop out at you. I really like that. I mean, yeah, I'm just a big fan of flashy stuff, though. I like it. I like the standard regular card stock with the flashy appearance to it i've just always appreciated that something sim simple about that that i can appreciate something simple simple by design and while this is a one of one these gem masters are one of ones um they're very simple cards in, in a way i but they're beautiful they're very beautiful cards he's gonna probably sit on this for that price for a long time now who knows maybe he's expecting to get 250 but he's maybe hoping for more if he asked you know 2000 i'd I don't know how many people have fronted offers on this card, although I can look it up. So, uh, Ryan, you and I opened a box of 99 uh, Metal Universe back in 2013. You remember that? Yeah, that was a fun box. <laughs> we got it at a pretty good price. At yeah, a cool, not bad. Uh, cool shop in Orange County. And, yeah. Um, we did get a Precious Metals uh, Nefi Perez, Nefi mm -hmm. Perez. Um, so... Yeah. That's in my collection yeah. <laughs> forever. Right. 
but yeah, the PMG stuff is is really cool. Uh, when I used to collect Nomar, I would, I, I think I had two or three of those. Those were always really fun to see pop up because they, even though they're numbered to fifty, they're they're just exceedingly rare. Yeah. Um, and they're competitive when they do hit the market. So, um, on one hand, I do sort of understand overvaluing this Darren Erstad car, but on the other hand, um, I think you're right in like that two, three hundred dollar range is probably more realistic. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking more closer to two as well, knowing that Erstad's career like started out hot, but then kind of fizzled. Now he's like it's still in doing something in baseball, like coaching or something. He's not playing, obviously, but um, he's a college coach. That's okay. There you go. So he, um, I remember collecting his stuff in '96 in SP as a rookie card, that blue one. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember getting that in a pack and knowing it was like six dollars. Like, oh man, this guy must be good. So I put it in my box binder. The price just indicates to me that the seller doesn't want to sell it. He just wants right. to show it off. That's fine. At least we get a scan of it and I get to see it. It's cool. But yeah, those are the two auctions I saw recently. I just wanted to talk about because they're you know cards that I like for one reason or another and you know just stuff you don't really see too often so mm-hmm. uh moving on we're going to finish this up with a discussion on some pickups ryan you want to introduce us with a couple of items that you recently picked up sure uh so i was i kept it pretty light um in october because my summer was pretty heavy financially with cards um, but there were a couple pieces i really wanted to pick up um, specifically before the playoffs got super hot and heavy um, the 2010 Bowman Chrome Alex Bregman refractor I picked up, um, and I know you have a few examples of that card. Um, I do. I mean, if, if Bregman continues the way he's going, I think this this Bowman Chrome from 2010 is going to be a really nice thing to have. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you have a few nicer examples than me, but I wanted to at least get a refractor. Totally. And I haven't tracked prices. Is, um, since I picked this one up, I think if if the Astros would have made it to the World Series for a second time in a row, his prices would have shot up a little bit. But mm-hmm. they they lost the Red Sox, obviously, so his prices will probably sort of stay where they are, um, which aren't necessarily cheap, but they are affordable. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was sort of like my favorite pickup from the past month or so. And then. I picked up a 2018 Gold Label Class 2 um, Shohei Otani, mm. and it's the blue parallel number to 99. Mm-hmm. Um, and when the Gold Label first hit the market, um, I I got this for a pretty good price because I think it was just a couple days after it hit the Gold Label had hit eBay, mm-hmm. um, and prices were still sort of sussing themselves out. Um, and so I figured if I could get an Otani rookie number to 99. Um, for a reasonable price, then I just got to do it. Sure. So I did it. <laughs> Good. Good, man. Um, and that, that card, I think there's like a red parallel. It's numbered to 50. And obviously there's the class one, two, three, like there was with the original top Gold label. So Right. So how it works is that the base, you get your standard base top Gold class one, two, three. And you got the blue ones, class one, two, three. And then the red ones, one, two, three. And the gold ones, one, two, three. Golds are one of ones. And then reds are like, it's it's 75, 50, and 25 print run, class one, two, three, respectively. Blue, they're going to be higher. Mm. And then the base cards have just a standard pattern on them. So I I I like those cards a lot. I've always liked Topps Gold Label. Um, I, I've, because I've sort of retired my, temporarily um, buying a lot of post-career Thomas stuff because I can't keep up. It's just there's so much stuff coming out every year. And he signs mm-hmm. everything. Um I've just been watching the market on Topps Gold Label. I would like to put get at least the three red parallels if possible, class one, two, and three. I did that, I think, last year or the year before, and I really liked those um, the new installments of Gold Label. I think it's just they're great looking cards. Yeah, it's it's a solid product. Um, it's I mean to buy the wax, it's a little too expensive for me. Mm-hmm. I tend to shy away from the quote unquote premium um, Topps products that are being put out these days. Right. But it's really fun when they first hit the shelves and then sellers are putting um, cards on eBay mm-hmm. um, just to kind of cherry pick what you want. And so that way you're not just wasting money on totally packs of cards you don't want. That's so, how I buy. I just like uh, I like to watch people open wax, but I prefer just yeah. to be an observer and just kind of be like, oh, they pulled something I maybe might want it, you know, at the right price. Yep. And just kind of wait for stuff to surface. 
yeah, let somebody else take the big financial risk and <laughs> then you can go buy what you want. There you go. And then so the last card I purchased, which I'm happy to have, is uh, 2001 uh, Bowman Chrome Ichiro Suzuki. Oh, um, wow. Nice. Good, good stuff. That's just the base Chrome. Uh, um, obviously, there's a couple different parallels of that yeah. card, which yep. become very, very expensive. But yeah. Ichiro is one of those guys, I think we've talked about this on the podcast before, that um, considering the current state of his career, um, I you know, I'm trying to pick up as much as I can within mm. reason, because right. um, he's a no doubt first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, you know, legend in Japan and in America. Yeah. Um, one of probably is going to go down as like one of the best hitters up there with Pete Rose and those types of players. Sure. So yeah, Ichiro, the Pujol stuff from that same year. You know, if I see it for a good price i try and pick it up because i i want to have a nice little stash of both those guys sure. once they get to the hall of fame yeah those are good man so those are my three those are nice nice ads good taste uh, i got a um otani ichiro and a bregman those are all very good solid decisions i'm i'm hoping that otani has a long career that's productive uh, we'll kind of see how he pans out in 19 uh, post Tommy John surgery. So, but, um, you know, wishing them all the best. So moving on to mine, I, uh, I want to introduce us with something interesting is, uh, 2001, uh, private stock artist canvas proofs, Roger Clemens. Now this is a one of one. Okay. This is the, mm. they, uh, there, you can get one of one parallels of these artist canvas cards and they do look like proofs. I mean, they're not fully colored. They're not fully colored in, um, but they're legitimate pack issued cards. Insertion ratio, I don't, I can't say it off the top of my head, but um, I found this in one of my saved searches, and I was like, oh, I'll grab that. You know, I, of course it was auction style, so I had to kind of bid aggressively to get it, but I knew it was like my only opportunity to get one of these things in the archive as just a type. Mm -hmm. uh, really cool stuff. So I, I, I picked that up. I was surprised there wasn't more action on it, knowing that like he's a Yankee and Yankees have pretty significant followings and there's you know team collectors and this kind of thing. But I was glad there wasn't more action on it because it mean that it meant that I, I I could you know I had a chance to get the card. So I got that. That's 2001 private stock artist canvas proofs one of one Roger Clemens. Uh, I I picked up a um I've wanted a a pack issued Rick Porcello a high end one for a while. And so I grabbed the, uh, I, 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 this one surfaced right around close to like in the postseason pre World Series air time, like right in there. 2009 Tops Tribute Red One of One Parallel Rick Porcello rookie card. Wow, awesome. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, he's Red Sox, really, Red Sox uh, pitcher, really good. I, I was, I thought he was a great, great pitcher, even when he was on the Tigers. So I, I, was gra I grabbed this. I think it was a nice addition to like how I collect what I've been collecting lately. It's just uh, super boutique rookie cards of guys I like. And, nice. Uh, Top Tribute's so cool. Super cool. Such a great Rest product. Rest in peace. Yeah. yeah. Such a, they might, I mean, I don't know if they're going to bring it back or what the deal is with that, but I hope they do because I liked, I just like the designs and just the beautiful cards. Um, so that's my number two. And then my number three is, I'm just going to mention this one, um, 2011 Topps Hope Diamond Anniversary Mark Trumbo rookie card. Now, Ryan, nice. I, I, I brought this to your attention right around and I was considering bidding on it. And I was mm -hmm. one of two bidders, but the bidder, the first bidder was like a dollar over the entry price. So I, you know, it was like 30 bucks and change, you know, it wasn't that big a deal. The entry mm -hmm. price was 30 bucks. I think he bid like 31. So like I had to, you know, it's 31 bucks, but I wanted to get this card because, um, I think it goes well with the super fractor that I own of this card, not this particular card. The super fractor is a different pose, uh, pose, but it comes from 2011 tops Chrome, obviously. So the tops card is they, you know, they do different poses, but, um, glad to have this. I've always liked the hope diamond anniversary set. That blue sparkle is just almost unbeatable. It's beautiful stuff. It's so, really cool. Yeah, I really like that. And Trumbo was a hot stud in 2011. He was one of the guys to look at and look forward. And so um, I just think it's a great card. And so there you have it, 2011 Tops Hope Diamond Anniversary Mark Trumbo rookie card. So those are my three. 
really glad to have those. Uh, for those of you that want to see more of my baseball card collection, just go to the museum and it's museum.radicards.com. And when you're there, hover over the, uh, the tab that says gallery and you'll see a sub tab called medley. And in there, you'll find all my non Frank Thomas stuff that I like. Okay. So just want to give you a heads up on that for those of you listening. Thank you for listening. Uh, uh, Ryan, do you want to, do you have any final thoughts? Um, it's always kind of a sad time. It was, we break off from the world series into the harsh winter of football and hockey and I guess basketball for those like that like basketball. Um, <laughs> but it was fun season. And I'm glad that we sort of started the podcast to, uh, recap things in the season. Yeah. Sort of kept me on my toes a little bit. Sure. Um, so that's all I got for now. All right. You know, for those of you listening, uh, thank you for listening. And I hope that you continue to tune in, uh, for the off season, Ryan and I are going to be talking about things that are baseball and baseball card related as usual. Uh, but we're going to kind of try to keep it as interesting as we can by being as creative as we can. Right. So I've, I've, mm-hmm. I'll be sharing some concepts with Ryan and we'll sign a kind of like game plan it um, for some of the off season stuff. So be sure to tune in. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Radicards podcast and radicards.com. I'm your host, Patrick Greeno. And until next time, enjoy collecting. If you like this content, please subscribe. Thank you. Enjoy collecting.